it's my great honor and a uh, pleasure for a guy I've gotten to know really well over the last few years. He's one of the most successful coaches in NFL history, and he is a Super Bowl champion yet again. Uh, what a thrill for us here. About 10 days removed from his fourth Super Bowl title, Steve Spagnuolo, welcome to the season with Peter Schrager. <laughs> Love it, Pete. It's an honor to be on this show. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? Look, I'm looking yeah. at it. I Googled, I Googled something because I'm so tech savvy. Which coordinators have won the most Super Bowl titles? And what comes up is this. The defensive coordinator who has won the most Super Bowl titles is Steve Spagnuolo, who now holds the record for any D.C. in NFL history with four. Washington's Richie Pettibon, Pettibone, 1982, 87, 91, and Romeo Cornell, 01, 03, 04, each have three. But Spagnuolo has four. When you hear that, what is your reaction? Well, first of all, I know those two coaches I got a lot of respect for. I, so I did an internship, Pete, way back in, I want to say it was the fall of 82 or 83. It was after the Redskins, uh, when they were the Washington Redskins, yeah. won their first Super Bowl. And Richie Pettibone was the D coordinator. I got to know. I love this. Coach, how about that? How about I love that? This. And then fast forward, whatever that is, 30 something years. And uh, ah, it's quite an honor. Very humbling. Listen, I think every coach would tell you, Pete, that. When a coach gets an award, it's not a it's not an individual award. I mean, you can't get coaching awards for winning or being successful on one unit without a bunch of players and a bunch of assistant coaches. So to me, it's just a um, it's a reflection of all the good people I've worked with. Yeah. And the honor to be lone guy in history, it's for any coordinator, too, because no offense to coordinator is one for you're the lone four time Super Bowl champion as a coordinator. Each different season tells a story. Right. So you had. Yeah. The 07 Giants, which you beat mm -hmm. the Patriots, and then you've had these three with the Chiefs. What's 10 days removed? What's the what's the story of this group? And what's the the feeling you have removed? The takeaway of like what you'll look back on or what you do in the in the in the, in the near history or the recent history of, of what really stands out from this unit. Yeah. I I'll tell you what, uh what stands out, I've said this a lot, uh, Pete, is the 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 tremendous uh culmination of high IQ players. I mean, I've, I've worked with some real high IQ football players. I mean, you guys know Antonio Pierce is the head coach in the league now. You guys, I don't know if you'll be, um, I mean, you remember the Jeremiah Trotter, James Laronitis that I had. I'm thinking about all these linebackers that we worked with that were really, really smart. But the the Sam Madisons, you know, the the Kavika Mitchells, the guys that we had in New York. But as a, as a group, as a unit, as a number, this was the highest total of high IQ players, combine that with high character guys, really good assistant coaches. That's what sticks out. Like we were able, Pete, quite honestly, to be multiple because we had guys like Nick Bolton and, you know, guys like LJ Sneed and, you know, guys up front like Mike Dana, you know, Turk. I mean, guys that they just get football. Um, they love embracing football. Drew Tranquil, you know, mm -hmm. all these guys that we had at linebacker, Leo Chanel, they just, eat, drink, and sleep it, Pete. And when you have that, and then you throw in a bunch of good assistant coaches, I mean, it made for a really good recipe. This is the craziest stat that didn't get enough love. The Chiefs were the youngest defense in the league this year. And you're talking about, you're naming guys like like LJ Sneed, and of course, you know, Dana's, I think, in his fifth year in the league, but yeah. Trent McDuffie stepped up. Willie Gay was awesome when you guys needed him. There's so yeah. much youth on this roster and yet all those guys, the mental errors were not there. They were Johnny on the spot every time they had to be. Yeah, you know, Pete, it's funny. I think this time last year when you and I talked a little bit after the game, I mean, we were pretty young last year. With, I mean, though, uh, that secondary was specifically young with three true rookies and Trent, Josh, and Jalen. Um, but you're right. The, the other guys that feel like they're veterans now have only been two or three years in the league. And so, but I tell you what, Pete, I've said this before when, so when you make that statement or, or we talk about that, you can't help but credit the assistant coaches for that because one person can't do it. A coordinator can't do it. And players need to be fed all of this information. They need to embrace it, but it needs to be fed in a way that they understand it, they get it and they can play fast. And I, I got a great staff. I don't know how, if you get a chance to get to know those guys, Pete, but shout them out. I'm Cause it's Merritt. It's Cullen. Who yeah. Got? Shout them out. Yeah. Dave Merritt, Brendan Daly, Joe Cullen, uh, Terry Braden, Rod Wilson, uh, Alex Whittingham, Donald Delasio. I don't think I've missed anybody, but it's a great group. I'll tell you the other thing. So, 
when you are blessed to go as far in the playoffs as we have for these past five years, the downside is all of these guys who should be coordinators or should be moving up in the league. It's hard to do, Pete, right? Because the jobs are all washed up by the time you get done in February 11th. And now, listen, it's a blessing to, to win Super Bowls and all that. And I don't think any of these guys are going to give their yeah. rings back for a job. But, but I mean, it's really – so I just don't think they get enough credit, Pete. And I just want to make sure that we always – recognize what they what they mean in the middle of this whole thing i don't know if you get enough credit i thought i don't know if you saw and i know you're not living on twitter you're, you're one of the fortunate yeah, no. ones <laughs> um i made a big case how absurd it was that you weren't being mentioned for head coaching jobs and you're probably blushing like don't even go there kevin yeah. demoff comes out of the cobwebs i don't even know where he and he goes on a 10 tweet so did you see any of this? <laughs> well, somebody sent it to me, and I'll tell you what, I'm, I uh, and I did uh, text Kevin back. Let me give the context Oops. first for the listeners. Okay. Demoff was in St. Louis where you were the head coach for three years, and Kevin listed about 15 reasons why you had no chance to actually have great success because of the ownership change, because of things that were done before you got there, because of just the climate of what was going on in St. Louis and the money and all this stuff. And Kevin wore it and was like, let me be the first to tell you Spags would be an incredible head coach and should have been. He didn't have the resources or the opportunity that others had to really have success. And I thought that was pretty cool to get that from a guy who, for being honest, they fired you. And yet he's coming back yeah. 10 years later and is like, no, 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 no. That was not on. That was not on Steve. Yeah. I, well, it was, listen, it was really nice of Kevin to say, I've always had a lot of respect for him. I think he's a real intelligent guy in this business. And listen, it was a challenge. I'd do it again, Pete, because the lessons you learn, you and I both know this, right? The lessons you learn from failure usually are more valuable than the ones you, you that you learn from success. And so I think there was some valuable lessons. There were some tremendous relationships pulled from there. And there's some things that we're really proud of. I mean, the overall record wasn't great, but I really enjoyed our 2010 season. We went from the 20. Uh, 2009, uh, where we were one and 15, and we drafted Sam Bradford, who mm -hmm. I thought was really, really good. He was exceptional. Good and player. Then he, was the, he, well, he, was the off, he was the offensive rookie of the year in 2010. You know, we were one game, last game of the season. We, if we win, we're in the playoffs. So that that we're proud of. And then it kind of fell apart in 2011. And listen, we all get this business, and it's about winning. And it, we didn't win enough games, so it happens. But nice, Kevin, to say. Uh, that's all in the past now. Listen, I'm, I'm blessed to have the things happen after that. And, you know, God puts us on these these trails and these journeys for a reason, Pete. And all of it's been very valuable for me. Yeah. Uh, obviously, your career it, it is so decorated with different players. You were mentioning the Jeremiah Trotters yeah. and the Kavika Mitchells, but also legendary coaches. Um, you you and I texted when you guys head, headed over to Germany. You're like, you know, I used to coach in the World League. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are, and I'm going back, and I'm coaching in Germany, and this is 30 years ago. Uh, take us through some of your mentors, coaching wise, who really gave you yeah. opportunities to elevate your career and move in this amazing path and have this journey to win four titles as a defensive coordinator. No, nah, a great question, Pete. I'm glad you asked it. I, I love talking about it. Well, if, if I go, if I move backwards, I mean, how blessed am I to work with what, what I consider two Hall of Fame NFL coaches in Andy Reid and Tom Coughlin? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in a close friend of mine, John Harbaugh, I spent two years in Baltimore with, which was, there was some growth. There. You know, listen, you know, when your peers, when you get to watch your peers do it and, and you know exactly what he's thinking and doing and you're able to pick apart his brain, that, that was two valuable years. But, you know, and then I go all the way back to to college where I don't know if you remember this name, Pete, but Jack McNell was the head coach of the Boston College Eagles when when Doug Flutie was the quarterback there and had that miracle down there in Miami. But I worked for Jack in in one of those years in NFL Europe. Uh, and, you know, Dick Curl was the head coach of the Frankfurt yep. Galaxy to what yep. you were talking about. And uh, Dick was um, nice enough to hire me as he, his defensive coordinator. But, you know, as much as the head coach, Bill Russo, I worked for Tom Jackson in Connecticut. I mean, the list goes on and on. Tim Murphy, who just uh, retired at Harvard, he's the Harvard head coach. He was the head coach at Maine at one time, and I worked for him for a brief period. But, you know, as much as the head coaches, Pete, you know, we learn and grow from the guys we work with uh, as assistant coaches across the board. And I, I love that part of it. I mean, one of the things John Harbaugh and I used to do when we were back in Philadelphia, we were together for eight years, both assistants. He was a special teams coordinator, and I, I either had the secondary linebackers or whatever year it was. But we would, we would evaluate each other, Pete. 
Mm. So he would spend the day, you know, as a special teams coach, he could watch all the other coaches. I'd say, John, just watch me for a day and then just give me feedback of things that I need to work on. And then I would do the same for him. I'd go out, watch a special teams practice. And then we used to bounce those things off of each other all the time. And so I think when you do that, the growth is just greater than just what you might get from a clinic or from uh, working from a head coach. But just the relationships to me are what, what I tra- cherish. And of course, the late great Jim Johnson had yes. such an impact. Talk about who Huge he impact. was and what and what he yeah. brought to the, to the game. Listen, I don't think uh, any of us, and, and you know the list, Pete, of the guys that worked for Jim, myself, Ron Rivera, Leslie Frazier, Sean McDermott, John, John Harbaugh, the, the list goes on and on, right? And the influence he had on all of us from a defensive perspective, he was, our, Pete, we were at the Combine one time, and I remember, uh, so I'm, I don't know, I'm early 40s, and, you know, Jim's into his mid-60s, and he's kind of at the end of his career, but he's doing great. You know, we're, we're kicking butt in Philadelphia defensively. And one of his buddies, who's probably the same age, comes up to him and says, hey, Jim, I see you finally got your retirement defense in. And so we didn't really know what he was talking about. So we asked him, he goes, well, Jim's wanted to do all these exotic, crazy <laughs> defenses. And now he does them because he figures if they don't, they don't work, he's retiring anyway. Right. I thought that was the greatest line in the world. That's because, hilarious. Yeah, because one of the things Jim d- did do and, you know, from watching was he would take he would take some real oh. chances at what we did and overloaded. Brian and Dawkins still... lining up on oh, the defensive yeah. line yeah. like crazy. Yeah. Stuff. It, it's not as much of a chance when you got Brian Dawkins yeah. doing it, but. But I tell you what, there were things we did that were a little unconventional, um, and we still do them today. I mean, we don't. Yeah, you know, we'll, offensive offensive coaches are pretty smart now, so they'll hurt you if you get too crazy. But um, because of his influence is where I'm going. I think a lot of us have things that we wouldn't have had had we not worked with Jim. Giants era. You go there, 2007. Obviously, you guys have all this incredible playoff run. Talk about that defensive front and working with yeah. Tuck and OC and, and Strahan and of course Jay Alford and Dave Tollefson and and I love I love that 07 Giants defense. And if you can give us a little color on preparing for that offense, which at the time was the greatest offense the NFL had ever seen, yeah. and having those 10 Pete, days to to build some sort of defensive game plan. I remember Pete um <clears throat> in the lead up to the game, you know, looking at as you watch the tape and Tom Brady and the weapons they had and Randy Moss, all of them. Um, I remember saying, oh, my God, if we could just hold them under 35, you know, maybe we got a maybe we got a chance. I mean, if we don't, we got no chance. But I mean, that's how dynamic they were. But uh, you led this thing with with those names up front. And certainly any defense has to start up front. So but I will say this. I'm going to go back to Antonio Pierce. He was yeah. the glue in the middle mm. that really kept it all together. Like he could he could. That's why he's such a good head coach now. He could connect all the rooms because he can speak the language of the DBs and the linebackers and the D line. He can go over to the offensive guys and he can, I mean, he can rile things up and he knows how to get people. And that's why he's so good at what he's doing now. I knew, I told his dad five years ago when he got in the league as an assistant, I said, he'll be a head coach in five years. He said he'd that to his dad? By, I love yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. He'd, be, he'd beat it by two years because that, that's Antonio. But do you remember he was, an NFC championship game? He has a hit on, on either Ryan Grant or Brandon Jackson and, and it's up in green Bay and Antonio Pierce saves a touchdown on a third and long on a little screen pass. It's one of the greatest defensive plays the giants have ever had. Pete, great memory. He, he warded off to, there was nobody there. If he gets blocked by uh green Bay's offensive lineman, I mean, he would have been in the, in the end zone. It's a huge play. I mean, it was, that might've been Pete. It might've been one of those risky calls that you say, Hey, I'm going to take a <laughs> shot here. He's on an <laughs> Island. And, 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 and and Antonio saved us, but but then you go back on the back end there, Pete. You know Sam Madison, who's coaching mm-hmm. now down with the Miami Dolphins. He was a corner. Corey Webster, James Butler, um, uh, Jabrell Wilson. I mean, we had a bunch of guys that just you know not household names, yeah, yeah, yeah. not superstars, you know. But they it was just another group that played like that, high IQ. Uh, it was a little rough early in the year, but because they all stuck with it and they believed in it and they believed in each other, it got better and better and better. And then in that game, I mean, the biggest thing in that game for us, Pete, was we didn't allow – I don't think we allowed a pass completion over 20 yards. In other words, we didn't allow the explosive pass mm-hmm. play, which is the same thing that happened in this past one. And I think when you do that, you know, and you can make a play here or there, you can keep the, the point total down. And, you know, we certainly did it in that game and obviously in this past one too. You've coached in all these Super Bowls. Yes, you've won four, but there's other games that you've coached in there. So 
the Super Bowl week, I thought Mahomes had such a subtle little comment that didn't get enough pickup. And I, I went big on it on Good Morning Football. He said, yeah, and I'm doing my Pat voice. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> we're just going to – I'm just going to do what I always do this week. I'm going to stick to my routine. And I said, what a subtle flex that he has a Super yeah. Bowl week routine. Like so many players yeah. just, just desire to get to one, and he's got a Super Bowl week routine that he does. You must have it too. When do you start cracking open the books on a Niners offense? Does that start – the second you get home after you guys, you know, beat the Ravens on Sunday or you take a couple of days and then, you know, you're a mastermind and you're going to be humble yeah. about it. But when do you start employing, like, <laughs> here's how we stop this team? Well, it does happen that Monday. Like we did not do very much with the previous games. So we, um, we win the, we went in Baltimore, right? We have the, i tell you what was different, Pete, was we had a plane flight after an AFC championship. Yeah, usually home. Had, You're right. We had been home. So that was a little bit different. That was enjoyable. And Again, normally... subtle flex. No. <laughs> <That's right. And laughs> actually not, had to board a plane. Flex. It just kind of popped <laughs> in my head. But, you know, normally on the plane after a game, I would watch the game that we just played on the iPad. I didn't do that. I just I just figured that was time. Let's just enjoy this. But uh, the minute we got up Monday morning, it was right into San Francisco. Uh, and the way Andy does things is we, we kind of keep, a normal week for that first week, Pete. Uh, the only thing that's different is getting ready with tickets and all that. But, but he pushed it back one day. So, when we finally got to Wednesday during that week, it was an NFL Tuesday, and then Thursday was an NFL Wednesday, and we got on a normal flow. So that by the, by the time we got on the plane on on Sunday, really 80, 80 85 percent of the work is done. Now there's some tweaking. And that's where coaches can get themselves in trouble. Yeah, they can you overthink got a, you got a whole it, right? other week. Yeah, yeah. and that, that that goes on too. And I, I always tell, I told the defensive staff, make sure you put a put some reins in on me because mm -hmm. if I walk in here and say, hey, we need to put this in, you know, give me the whoa, 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 we might not need to do that. And uh, so that's a challenge. That that second week is a challenge for a lot of reasons. You know, keeping the guys focused, which our guys do a great job of. Um, making sure you're not putting too much in because you have the extra week looking at too much film. I had to stop myself from watching film at one. Are you one of those film junkies? I, I don't know that about who's yeah. what. Like I know I talked to McVeigh a lot, and he'll be up at four in the morning looking at like 1998 film. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I listen. I don't. Every once in a while, you go back and you have. Oh, I got to go back and look at such and such. That's where you drive the video people crazy, right? Hey, can yeah. you get me the? Give me the Philadelphia Eagles 2001, whatever. Um, and then they got to go digging for it. Uh, but, yeah, I think we're all built like that, Pete, because that's where it begins, right? That's where your ideas are formulated. That's where you can – and this is – listen, this is a beg, borrow, and steal defense. I, I mean – uh, Beg, uh, borrow, uh, and steal. No, I love that. No, beg, borrow, and steal profession. We all do that. Like you'll see a – you'll see an idea. Oh, what did they do that? And you might tweak it a little bit, but you're stealing it from somebody, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. There's, nobody's got an original idea anymore. Um, but that's what the beauty of this game is. It goes in cycles, right? I mean, we're seeing some running football coming back now after yep. years and years of all the spread and throwing it all over the place. And uh, and you just try to stay ahead of the cycle. But I think we all enjoy – if you don't enjoy grinding tape, then you're probably not in the right business. I said the biggest X factor is going to be Spags versus Kyle Shanahan. And I, it, they had their big plays. Like McCaffrey got his, you know, at points. Yeah. But you got it was Ben, but don't break for the most part for you guys. Yeah. Uh, the challenge of preparing for that offense. What was that like going yeah. into this thing? Well, not only do they have all those weapons like you and I know, but I mean, Kyle, Kyle is really good. Um, he makes everything look the same. You know, that kind of goes all the way back to his dad. I've always thought that that was a hard offense to to defend. And with all those weapons, it was just one of those games where you couldn't say, OK, OK, we just need to take that away. Because the minute you did that, he had so many other places to go. And, and Kyle figures that out. But it did begin with the running back. I mean, we couldn't let Christian McCaffrey. And he got, you know, he he poked away at a couple of runs yeah. and, you know, and had a pass completion that um, we just couldn't get there in time. Mike Edwards almost made the tackle, but then he spit out because he's does so that, good. Does that high step that, that run that yeah, he does? Yeah, yeah. Like he he just kind of did the delay, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen you do that before. Yeah, he that's me that in the streets stuff. of New York. That's me yeah. running from the cops. <laughs> but, I mean, it, with that offense, I mean, that's why they were so, so good all year long. It's just, But I will say this. Our, what really helped us was LJ, Trent, whether Josh or Jalen was in there because we did have to switch in the middle of that game to play a little bit more man. I, I didn't, just didn't think our zone coverage was was tight enough and they had a couple of completions there, those in-breaking routes that they always get. I thought our linebackers could get deep enough and our 
uh, quarter safeties would be there, but they're just so good. They and I think Brock Purdy, uh, I think he's terrific. And I'll tell you, you watch. I, I mean, you watched all the games, and yeah, you know, I, there's guys on TV, me included, who poke holes in Purdy's. No, but I, you got I, to watch I, I the whole. Find, yeah, I didn't find many. I, I tell you, the other thing that that stuck out was in those. You know, he, so we played Tua, we play uh, Josh Allen, Josh we play Lamar, Lamar Jackson, and you've got to worry about those guys always running the football. So we get now it's going to be San Francisco. We haven't watched a lot of film with them, so I don't really know them. Okay, it's a backup quarterback. Okay, maybe he's not a runner. Maybe we can, maybe we get a little break here. I turn the film on, and then he's ripping Green Bay and Detroit with a couple. Of, you know, the run plays. Oh, that the were third really down critical. against Detroit was I know insane. It. Yeah. And I, I said, okay, here we go. We got another one. I, I will, I'll tell, I'll be honest with you. Pete. I just texted Brock the other day. I tried to track down his cell number. I just wanted to tell him how much respect I have for him. And Hell what yeah. a terrific, Dude, I love what a terrific game he played. I mean, and I, he's, a, he's such a quality guy, strong Christian man. And I respect all of that. And I'm, I'm happy for all his success. I'm glad he didn't have quite, quite the totally. real good game. In the, but, but let's I, get, I let's get to the big spot. Cause it's third and four. And if Purdy converts a first down, the game yeah. is essentially over. Cause Pat doesn't get the ball back. Can you send yeah. McDuffie on a blitz? Now I've watched this play and I haven't spoken about it on television. Or I haven't spoken to Kyle about it. I thought it was interesting. They had Kittle in the backfield as the blocker and not yeah. McCaffrey. Who's traditionally back there. Did that, did that raise a red flag to you and say, okay, we've got something. What What was your thought on third and four coming out of a huge stop the play beforehand? Cause if they get the first yeah. down, they bleed the clock, kick a field goal game is over. I think that was, did Trent make that play on yeah. Kittle on a blue play? Yeah, it was a great tackle. Um, well, here's what happened, Pete. So if you remember on that play, um, it, there was about two twenty or something or mm -hmm. two fifteen when they broke the huddle. So we made a call. Because I didn't know if he was going to let it come down to the two minute or not, and they decided to let it come down. We made a particular call, and then when it went to the two minute warning, and of course with the with the Super Bowl with these you timeouts, have this big break to discuss. Big break, huge break. So that's when the wheels go like this. And so it was at that moment you look up, and go, okay, this is really in my mind. I said to myself, is it? this is real. This is a fourth down play. This is not a third and four or five. What it was. This is critical. I had a thought. I looked at my list and I said, I need to ask Nick about this. This is the trust I have in Nick Bolton. So Nick's this. on the field. Now he can't, he can't talk to me, but I'm staring right at him. I, I clicked the button and I said, Nick, what do you think about this? I, all I wanted to do was see his reaction. And he just started, yes, yes, yes. And he did the signal. And it, he was like, he was all in. And so I knew, <laughs> I knew when he was all in that we should change it to that. So we changed personnel and put a, a different call in, and it was a fourth down call, or, or, or what we had on our fourth down list, and it was for the critical situation, and fortunately for us, you know, uh, the, our guys executed it really well. I mean, Chamari Connor, if you go back and watch it, Pete, he kind of goes back. He At first, he was a little bit confused uh, because for the, to the point you're making uh, about Kittle being in the backfield, but the guys unwound it, and uh, Jay Reed was critical in it, Trent was critical, and you know, and, and Trent looks, hits that Trent, hole and comes right yeah. in. And th yeah. does he tip the pass or is he just he did. Do enough? He did. He's really good at that. I mean, he, we, you know, we, we're all about trying to find free runners, right? However, we can dissect it and it's, we can't always get them, but in that play we did. And I, you know, I, I watch it and I thought our man coverage, um, Dion Bush was in there because we had, mm -hmm. if you watch it, I think there's eight DBs in there or something. Yeah. We only have two, two linemen and uh, it was something that we had. But Dion, I think Dion's gonna. I think Dion's gonna make a break in such a, a way that I maybe he knocks it down. So I just thought the guys, the way they played it, was they executed it perfect. And you get the ball back, and on that moment, you go to the, everyone's coming to the sidelines. Are you guys just freaking? Like, yes, we did it. Like, we needed to make a stop, well, it and we did it. Like, that's got to be the coolest. You change the play call at the two minute warning. You get the play, yeah. and now you give Mahomes a chance, and you have to have the utmost confidence that oh well, this dude's gonna get it done. Well, there's no question about that. Now, we'd rather not put him in that situation, <laughs> you know, because now he's got to come down and tie it. But all the confidence in the world in Patrick and uh, our guys, I think, know that. If we could have just – I think I think early in that particular drive we're talking about, um, they hit a – they hit a, a one of their longer passes early in that drive. Now, that – you know, we're talking about the good one, but I'm always thinking about the one that I should have changed. Um, and then there was one – and then the one that – 
that sticks out is the third and 13 in overtime that we got the penalty on Trent. Yeah, holding. Little tug, yeah. And, and uh, you know, they called it, so that's the way it is. But it would have been nice if we could have sent Patrick out yeah. there in overtime. End it right there. And come down, yeah, and then kick a field goal. But that's okay. I mean, it was dramatic for the public. We wanted, we wanted the public to have a dramatic game. With it was pretty Patrick cool. Um, yeah. I, I guess I my next question is, you know, with, with that victory and you guys are – are celebrating and, and the deal like did, did the players, do they, you're talking about McDuffie now has two Super Bowl rings in two mm. years and Sneed's got three trips to the Super Bowl. Like do the players yeah. recognize just how special this is? Do you think they, they, they understand just how absurd it is what you guys are doing? That's, that is a great question, Pete, probably a better question for them. I, I mean, you try to remind them, but in the middle of it, you know, that, you know, all the dancing in the locker room and everybody's just enjoying the moment. I think that we all will someday, you know, be able to kick back and say, wow, um, because look at, and here's, here's the beauty of these elite athletes. I'm talking about Patrick and Travis and Trent and LJ and all these guys and Chris Jones. Um, the minute, you know, we're in the middle of that celebration, they're talking about trying to win a third one. I, and it's just, I mean, for Patrick to to <laughs> think of that on the field, I'm like, man, I need a break. You know, he's talking about wanting to win a third one. But isn't that the beauty of this, these elite athletes? That's how they're wired. That's how they're built. That's a good transition. Um, I went on Fox Sports 1. So usually I'm on NFL Network, but we're off for the week. And they asked me if I wanted to come on Fox Sports 1. I went on it yesterday with Nick Wright, who's a fellow Kansas City, you yes. know, big fun. He's yeah. a big fan. Love he was Nick. at the parade. Nick's a great dude. Yeah, I saw him. And uh, he was at the parade and all this stuff. And we're on the show and we're talking about Chris Jones. And I'm not going to ask you about where you think that contract and all that is. That's not your job. And you just coach the guys and you don't have to worry about that. But I said, if he never takes another snap again, I think Chris Jones is a hall of famer. And I'll go further. When they did the coach, the defensive player of the year voting, he didn't get a single vote. 11 other players did. We're talking guys like Deron Bland and Dexter Lawrence are getting votes, but Chris Jones didn't get a single vote. I think he might be the under the most underappreciated player of this entire Chiefs run and maybe the most underappreciated defensive player of his generation. You've coached him the whole way mm. through. Chris Jones, talk about what he brings to the table and how much he's come a long way too in the last what couple of years way. where he's yeah. now a leader on this defense, yeah. which I love to see. I, his growth uh, just even throughout this year was just awesome to watch and see. And I told him that uh, when we had our exit interview and we talked to him a little bit. But you know I don't know, Pete, maybe because he's been so good and so dominant, do people just get used to it? So when it's, you know, when it's only 10, only, right? When you get 10 yeah. and a half sacks, that's pretty good as an interior lineman. And yet people, I think just, I don't know, maybe, maybe the same, maybe that happens with these elite athletes, but I'm, I'm with you, Pete. Um, the year he had, the impact he has for us defensively, the things that we're able to do because we know people are going to double them. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're anticipating that. And so you do other things and it opens up for, for some of our other guys. But, I mean, we love him. I hope we don't lose him. I mean, he knows that. And I think I know he'd like to say we'll see what happens. You know how this yeah. league is. I mean, it's, I get it. it's one of the yeah, it's one of the reasons during the course of this run of the playoffs that, uh, you know, and I'm a Christian guy and I, I have my prayer time. But I'm, I was always praying. Just give me one more week with these guys. I just yeah. want to work with them one more week because it's going to change. It's it's going to change, and that's the reality of it. But the relationships remain. Yeah. Um, yeah. As we turn the page, when do you kick it back up and say, okay, I'm looking at a prospect from Kansas State or TCU? I mean, <laughs> do you give yourself that grace period of, guys, can we just enjoy this for two weeks, or do you get right back into combine mode? Well, the thing we got right back into was evaluating our own guys because we got to, you know, we visit with uh, Brett Veach, who's the best. Um, and then I'll be honest with you, I have not done these last four or five days. I have not done much. This was all mm -hmm. Maria time. This was yep. all this was all Maria time. And when we get to Monday, I think we'll be kicking it right back into um, full mode. And, and we need to do that. We're behind a little bit. That's what happens when you go on these long playoff runs. But uh, we'll get caught up. Two questions, and then we'll let you enjoy the last couple of days of freedom before we get back into football. Mode. Right, uh, yeah, you mentioned Maria, your lovely wife, and I think Chris Jones had some really cool stuff about her cooking and what she provides the team. That was the first time I'd heard that. Maybe I just am not in the Kansas yeah. City day-to-day. -day. Um, chicken parm, or, or was it veal parm? What was oh, it that was all. her specialty? Okay. You you name it, Pete. She, she can cook it. She, she'll, she does soul food. She does everything. It's not just that Italian. I mean, she's full Italian, and she's a great yeah. cook. But you know what, Pete? She loves to do it. It's her way of 
she'll say this all the time. It's her way of connecting with these guys and it's her way of showing her love for them. Like, I mean, everybody needs to, and these guys are all away, you know, for the most part away yeah. from home, right? They don't, they don't get home cooked meals. So we make it fun. We have what we call the cram award, you know, and the guy that has the big hit gets the big plate of pasta and, <laughs> and she, she makes stuff on Fridays. There's always, everybody always gets, you know, either the banana pudding or some kind of cake or something on Friday. And then Saturday we give out the award, but I think the guys enjoy it. And I, we like, we love doing it too. I love it. Um, yeah. And my last one is you mentioned the head coaching stuff and I think everyone takes it for granted. Like, Oh, well, he wouldn't want it. I thought it was interesting. You said that you'd be interested in again, then to maybe become a head coach again. And I don't think it's out of the, out of the picture. Um, is that something you still aspire for and is something is a goal or is it just if that happened to happen, you'd be happy. You're blessed either way. Yeah. I, mean, I do feel that way. I mean, listen, I'll answer it the same way I always do. Um, we're prideful men in this business. I mean, we want to win and we want to show that we're capable of doing things. Right. So I'm no different than a player. Would I love to do it? Yes. If, however, I, I always fall back on this and I, and this is the, always the follow up. If that never happens, I'm okay with it. I, I put these things in God's hands. It's, if his, if it's his will uh, to lead another team and young men and, and mentor and, and teach, which is what coaching is all about, then I'm, then I'll walk right in it and full bore. If not, I'm so, I'm so blessed, Pete, <laughs> to have the job I have, to work with the guys I work with Andy Reid. I mean, come on, you gotta be kidding me. So I don't lose sleep over it. Um, uh, but the answer to the question would be, yes, I would. Uh, but if it never happens, I'm okay too. I, I, it's a great answer. And I, I, you're at peace with it either way. Yeah. And, and guess what? They can never take away four different Super Bowl titles from, from you. One more, you get the full five finger treatment. I get the and, and you, got, you got them all. You could, you could do it that way. Uh, I quickly will say you and I, we've gotten to know each other in the last couple of years pretty well. Um, yeah. I'll never forget. You were the interim coach with the Giants. I guess after McAdoo got let go, was that what yeah, it was? Yeah, that was after Ben. Yeah. And it was yeah. Giants Eagles, and everyone was. And it was it was after the Wentz injury, so Eagles were coming into town, and everyone's like, "All right, we're not sure with the Eagles, but the Giants, they're done." And the yeah. way you got those Giants to fight after the coach being really, and that was a good game. And I remember the production meeting. You were so conscientious of finishing the season strong. And you were so hell bent on getting the most out of these guys. And Eli, what was his future? We don't know. He couldn't right. sing higher praises of you. I, I think that's as commendable as winning these these titles as a coordinator with this loaded Chiefs team. But like, hey, that Giants team was going nowhere, and we're playing the Eagles in Week 16, and we're going to give them hell. And I love that. You know, Pete, that's a. I'm glad you. That's a great memory. It was a hard time. It's not easy to to do the interim head coach thing in the middle of the season. It's not easy. Uh, different guys. You haven't really had time to put your spin on it but that particular game i thought our guys fought hard it was i think we we might have went for it on fourth down something at the end it was really close we could have scored and won the game but you know pete when you were taught when you were saying that what jumped in my mind it, i've been blessed with these super bowls playoff runs the whole thing we won that that year we beat the washington redskins on the last game of the season and the game meant nothing it mm -hmm. meant nothing to them it meant nothing yeah. to us but i will tell you this i love winning this. that game i i walked in that locker room i was as excited about winning that game as any i'd been a part of just because of what we had been through and, yeah. and just the, the locker room celebration on <clears throat> on any win is special uh, i mean when you it's hard to explain what it's all about but guys that are in the business players or coaches or personnel know how hard it is just to win one game in this league. And I just, I cherish that moment. I ended up with a, you know, the guys, the equipment guys got me a game ball and that I game love it. ball that meant nothing right, is as valuable to me as, as any that, uh, that I've been a part of. So thanks for bringing that up. Cause that was, that was a special time. That's so awesome. Uh, and my last story is probably five years ago. You had just joined the chiefs. You hadn't even coached a game with the chiefs yet. It was combine. It was late. I went to dinner with, I'll name you the name, Joe Thomas, the offensive tackle who is yep. now getting into TV. It was his first yeah. foray into TV. So like I was at dinner. This gentleman named Mike Miriano, who's now running Amazon's football stuff. Gentleman named Mike Connor, who's still with the NFL Network. And gentleman named Charlie Uke, who's with the NFL Network. And we go to dinner at one of the state, probably Shula's in the West End. And afterwards, because we're fat pigs, we're like, let's go get a milkshake from Steak and Shake. And we walk in and it's empty steak and shake is empty i get a banana milkshake i'm so excited it's literally 1 a.m this is terrible for my body and soul and in walk two bodies 
Steve Spagnolo and Andy Reid walking in at yeah. 1 a.m. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see you. What happens? I spill my entire milkshake all over myself. And you and Andy Reid are just looking at me like, you freaking klutz. I, re- I remember that. <laughs> hey, that's to be expected that late at night in a place like that, right? Come on. That's what it is. But uh, you were, awesome. you were graceful to me then. And uh, you've been great to me since. I appreciate these 40 minutes. I can't wait to see you. Uh, we'll hang at the combine for sure. Same but. Here congratulations another super bowl ring but as we've learned in this interview um it's not just the super bowls it's the entire journey and i think you appreciate that more than anybody yeah very much so pete i appreciate you having me on this was great man a lot of fun (laughs) 